Okay, we're live. Uh, welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Sunday Show. It's Sunday, June the 29th, two thousand fourteen, and um, hopefully we will not go off the air. I do not. I don't think we will. But my internet at my new place here is not all the way fixed. Uh, which if you're used to watching this show, you can see my background's different today. I don't actually have my desk set up yet, so I'm sitting in my easy chair. So, so I, I don't think we'll go off the air, but if we do, that's why. So, and uh, Livia Llewellyn was kind enough to join our panel, so she's going to be here most Sundays with us. So, I'm pretty happy about that. Yeah. <laughs> Unless I melt. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, you got that. Uh, uh, Rick said a minute ago, you got that fan going behind you, so we can work in the cool air reference already. <laughs> and you've got a fan going behind you. Yeah, you I do. You can see it in the corner. Yeah, I can see one above Mike's head. There's there's a oh, fan right, right here. Oh yeah, the ceiling fan. And then there's a fan yeah. right there. And I've got three more fans in the apartment going on. Oh wow, you've got a fancy fan. <laughs> it's almost like it's summer. You know, I, I have those in my house, too. <laughs> Mandy freaked uh, out because she was like, what did you just show? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently the bedroom is is not, you know, you know, public, uh, re public ready. Okay. Not ready for prime time, as they used to say. <laughs> so I, I've got a, a few things to talk about here. Uh, the first thing is uh, Rick told me before we went live that he just read uh, The Revenant of Rebecca Pascal. Yes, here it is. And, and it's a very uh, excellent uh, book. Go ahead and hold that up. I'm sorry. Rick. Show it some more. By Dave Barker and Willem Pugmire. Rick freeze or did I freeze? Okay, there we go. Sorry, I think Not I froze. It. Two different versions. You got the you got the fancy version, don't you, Rick? Yeah, I got the hardcover. I had forgotten, so we'll I'll go on my ego trip for a minute, which I usually don't do. But I had forgotten. Willem said he was dedicating a book to me, and then I got this in the mail, and opened it up. It says this book is dedicated to Mike Davis and the Lovecraft Easing. So I'm very excited about that, and. Uh, also, it's a damn good book, right, Ring? Right, and you know, one thing we 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 had some emails going back and forth about how to write a true Lovecraftian story, mm -hmm. and it shows. I don't want to go into the plot, but it's 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 not like you haven't read a story like this before, right? But it's executed brilliantly. You're going to see a very familiar plot done extremely well. At least very familiar in its basic components. Yeah, and you know you can say that about so many stories that a lot of stories are somewhat alike, you know. But how well is it done? I mean, we've said that a million times. Uh, that's by W. H. Pugmire and David Barker. Um, and as Rick said, uh oh, he, uh oh, he froze. <laughs> Yeah. Welcome back. Blurb. What? What, Pete? You uh, you froze for a minute. I did. You did. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Like I said, this internet is really sucking here. Um, I'll read the back blurb and, and on in the hopes that I don't freeze. In which hunt at Arkham, a restless spirit takes possession of an innocent woman and brings havoc to all who encounter her. Inspired in part by H.P. Lovecraft's The Thing on the Doorstep. Revenant of Rebe Rebecca Pascal takes you to ghostly houses and sinister Arkham burying grounds, where alchemy and madness join forces with a demonic entity aroused from beyond the wall of sleep. So, now there may be a Pete Rollick connection in this book. Well, what? Oh, there is a character named Abraham Waite, and you use that name. Let me get it. <laughs> yeah, this I got to hear. Yeah, yeah the, uh, Fossil Lake. Oh yes, I did. 
Oh, I don't yeah. know if this is the same Abraham Lee. It, I don't it, think there's not... any relation because there's no way that Willem or David Barker could have have known about that. Okay, well, it's not. I'll say this: there's nothing that prevents them from being the same person. Oh, nice. When I when I read it, I said, eh, "Yeah, I guess it could be." I mean, so I mean, yours is sort of set in an alternate universe, right? My green face universe. Right. Which, which we're, everybody we're all, like, what? We're, yeah. we're, we're all these great Lovecraftian movies made by the most fantastic directors imaginable. But instead of using, like, yellow face or black face, they actually hire, like, people from Innsmouth and, and Dunwich who are actually, like, half-breeds. So there's this whole green face movement to, you know, to quell them. And, you know, there's, there's a protective society and there's protests. And, equal uh, rights, equal rights for spawn of the great old ones. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it was a fun little exercise, but yeah, I, I liked it. Uh, but David Barker is actually, he's the, he's the author of one of my favorite story, Lovecraftian stories, The Leering Surf, which I think goes back to the 80s. And where can we find that? I don't know. Um... I think I photocopied it out of some place at Temple University. <laughs> uh, well, because Temple University has a weird fiction collection, and they have this really weird rule. At least they did in the in the um, in the '90s, where you could go in and you could read whatever you wanted, but you only could co photocopy five pages. Mm. And I'm okay. <laughs> so you're like, so every day you could go and you could copy five pages. That's it. Let me see if I can find it on IM, ISD, whatever. Yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I know. I, I can look it up there, too. All right. You're that probably... reminds me of, like, in, in um, 1976, there was a Brown University. And all of a sudden, I could hit these Arkham houses that were out of print. Right. And reading these obscure things like the Acolyte. They, all, all these little weird miso stories were there that, uh, Robert M. Price later ended up reprinting in his uh, Cthulhu, uh, this you know the acolytes of Cthulhu anthologies or tales of the Lovecraft mythos. Well, oh, the Leering Surf is actually from 1989, mm -hmm. and it appeared in Death Realm. Okay, yeah. Death Realm. Summer 1989. I Summer. think that, I think that's the same issue that has Joe Lansdale's um, mythos story, um, which the name of which is escaping me right now. Oh, uh, Pentecostal Punk Rock. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't been reprinted anywhere else? I don't think so. I think that he and um, Willem are working on a, a, a shared collection. You know, they're splitting it between the two. I think the Leering Surf will appear in there. Uh, I froze for a minute. Are you talking about David Barker? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That no. surf as, as in surfboarding? Yes. By the way, guys, if I do freeze or disappear, I, I think that's kind of going to be the way it's going to be today until they fix my internet, but I'm, I'll be back if that happens. So. Okay. Um, so anyway, uh, oh, we froze again. <laughs> I I thought it was I even <laughs> we're, gonna, we're, we're gonna call you Mr. Freeze. Dude. Great, that's great, that's great. Uh, let me start over. Uh, Blair Witch Project. I posted something about that on the Lovecraft Easy and Facebook page, and because there's this article um, that I found on the web, uh, basically talking about the Blair Witch Project and how it's a Lovecraftian movie, and it came up because um, there was a AMA, Ask Me Anything, for Ramsey Campbell at Reddit, and Ramsey said something about that it's, the, in his opinion, one of the most Lovecraftian movies out there. So, 
predictably, we got some strong reactions. <laughs> yeah, there was a whole thread from a certain one of one of our favorite writers who just went off on it. Um, and I won't mention names, but um, okay. So here's what you don't know: is that I have taken tw- I have taken Ramsey Campbell shopping for movies <laughs> in Fort Lauderdale twice, and um, the guy watches the worst possible. <laughs> <laughs> like sci-fi channel? No. <laughs> like like Italian splatter. Yeah, no. Well, there, you know. Like, even... well, this is his job, right? He reviews movies for a living, and you know, he apparently has a great collection of really bad films, and he's always looking for video nasties, as we used to call them. Probably still do. These little movies that. You know, are pretty much you know made in the '70s and '80s, torture porn and bad special effects, and they are you know, one of his favorite things to watch. And I guess you have to watch a lot of crap to to know what's good. Well, even even something that's crap might have a good idea. Absolutely, sure. There was some very cr- one of the worst horror movies I saw production-wise. I can't, it was some movie was John Carradine doing a narration, and they were using old footage from American international movies like The Raven and The Pit and the Pendulum. And they were doing it was like four stories, and one of them was called Count Alucard. <laughs> and it just at the end, it just it, you know it was basically it was basically you know this guy goes to Transylvania. There's a Count Alucard as a vampire, and he's Tracking down vampires and whatever, and it just had it. What at, at the time was a nifty ending, and and it, this has been I'm sure done both. I've seen this later and probably had been done earlier. Just that the guy, the vampire hunter, turned out to be a werewolf. Okay. So I thought that was cool. The film was totally lousy, but. Uh, I think the title of the anthology movie was Dr. Terror's Gallery of Horrors. <laughs> Dr. Terror's Gallery of Horrors, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, that oh, was like... We had two Mike Davises. Oh, good. That's good. Yeah, I don't know if I should have attempted the chat today, but we're here, so. <laughs> <laughs> and one we'll, we'll will be frozen in time. That yeah. one will disappear, I'm sure. Looks look, looks like the Ru- Mount Rushmore portrait of Mike. Maybe I can get rid of him. <laughs> Lock yourself. See what happens. Yeah. What did I miss? Multiplying. Is this some kind of self reproduction? <laughs> <laughs> Multiplicity. We're just talking about bad movies. Let me see if I can eject my. Oh, I better not do that. It might eject the real me. <laughs> we, we, we we were talking about horrible uh, Ramsey Campbell collection of horrible movies. Yeah. And I just said every horrible movie might have a good idea buried in it. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and Ramsey, you know, touches on this in some of his work. Um, you know, what the ancient images and there's a few few stories and novels he's written about film. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, so he may have a valid point in watching some of the worst things possible. But so what do you guys think about that, though? That I mean, it wasn't just Ramsey saying that. The article listed some pretty good, pretty compelling reasons to think of it as somewhat of a Lovecraftian movie. I don't know if I have much of an opinion one way or the other. I'm not trying to push one way or the other, really. I just think it's something worthy of discussion. Well, when, well, I'll tell you this. When I saw it, I saw the sticks immediately. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you could you could think about it as a um, you know between sticks and and dreams in the witch house as a witch thing, and there's there's obviously a a, a problem with time and, and space in that film. But you you could say it's Lovecraftian, but if you can say that's Lovecraftian, then Picnic and Hanging Rock can be Lovecraftian too. Uh, some people say it is. Well, yeah. Well, Josie, 
Yoshi says that, um, what was that other movie by that same guy? Last Way. The Last, Last Way. Yeah, he says that's the most Lovecraftian movie he's ever seen, and some people strongly disagree with, with him on that. Yeah, well, you know, it's Australia. I don't know if it's Lovecraftian, though, because the, the Last Wave, it's not... I, I don't. I didn't get the impression that the Aboriginal characters thought of this just as, as a destruction, that it was uh, a, just part of nature. It was cyclical. You right, know? apostasis. Yeah, and there, that there was... I mean, I know in Lovecraft there's no... There is no true good or evil intent behind these vast cosmic forces that that shape the universe and go throughout it. Um, but so, so I, I didn't, I didn't get the impression that the last wave had had any kind of Lovecraftian aspect to it at all. I mean, I've seen it many, many times. It's one of my favorite films, and I never, I, I just never get the sense that that it's dealing with Lovecraftian themes. And I'm someone who, wa who always wants to see Lovecraftian themes in everything. Yeah. <laughs> and everything. Well, well, I think uh, some people see the, the 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 dream angle, the power of dreams, as being yeah. full of Cthulhu. I think he compared it to the Shadow Out of Time, and that. You know, I'm not saying I agree with him either. I don't. Yeah. No. I mean, I we have. Yeah. Let's just even remove Lovecraft from it. Is it a cosmicism movie? No, and, not really. And I don't, you know, if you can't say yes to that, then you can't say yes to Lovecraft. Yeah. I mean, is it about, is it a movie about how there are forces that modern man doesn't recognize and those forces might come back to bite us in the butt? Sure, but is it a cosmic, is it a cosmic power or is it local? No, it, it well, I oh, go go below. Um, I felt that the, the, if there was any kind of cosmic power, it was the ability for uh, the characters to see this coming through their dreams, that the, the oh, cosmic okay. part was the dream time, but that was separate uh, to this wave, which was purely, was just nature, some great force of nature, the world cleansing itself, or... or or that part of the world cleansing itself, and, and what was supernatural or, or cosmic was their ability to know in advance. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but, but I think Livia has a good point. It's, it could be Earth-centric rather than something from beyond the stars. Right. You don't, you don't, get, you don't get a hint of that in the movie. Yeah, I think that's, yeah. It... You know, I agree with you, Olivia. It's a movie that I really like, and I've seen it several times, and I still don't claim to understand it totally. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I don't. I would. I would disagree with Joshi on that too, on it being Lovecraftian. Okay, uh, so now let's go back to the original question: Is Blair Witch Project yeah. Lovecraftian? Yeah. Yeah. So I never. I never read Sticks. So when I and I and I Goodbye. actually it had been. <laughs> it had been many many years. From from reading Lovecraft to watching uh, the movie when it came out in the theater, um, like twenty years for me. So I I didn't I didn't get any sense at all that it was Lovecraftian. And now looking back on it and having people say it's there's Lovecraftian themes in it, to me it's just it's New England witch shit. <laughs> It's just all about the witches and 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 whatever you know magic you know and the rituals and that that kind of you know northern American uh oh did he freeze again <laughs> did you freeze oh, man, <laughs> or are you still I'm, no, I'm, I'm just I'm I'm not talking as much because I, I'm, oh, okay. I'm I <laughs> he was enthralled by what you were saying Olivia like yeah, oh my that's, god yeah, let's say it back. I made him freeze. <laughs> but anyway, I don't I don't believe it's Lovecraftian. I could be persuaded otherwise, but I would need to hear the arguments and maybe it's not Lovecraftian, it's Wagnerian. Because I mean, I, I, I know I'm saying I'm saying, you know, I mean because you know when we it's just like you know at some point, you know, a, a writer become who's part of let's say the Lovecraft school has transcended Lovecraft and has his own voice. You know, well, and, and that's a good question. You could, I mean, 
when I'm, I was watching True Detective, I see the little stick figures and I say, sticks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. But, and that's Carl Edward Wagner. And I think that, and so, you know, sticks is a Lovecraftian story. But Carl Edward Wagner was also a great King and Yellow writer. So, True Detective isn't Lovecraftian, it's Carcosan. So, and I'm, yeah, I am, I'm coining that term right now. Right. Chin beer, chin beer. Yeah, I, I think Joe Pulver already coined that term. Any I thought you were going to say King and Yellian or something like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. but, but, All right, how about this? It's Amarillan. There we go. But, 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 but sticks, I mean, the concept of stick figures and whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it's not, it's not something that one would associate with Lovecraft. We only associate with Lovecraft because Wagner wrote this excellent story. Right, right. So you know, it, it, we, I come to the same conclusion: is is that uh, True Detective is a weird tale, and yes, you can read it as Lovecraftian, but it's better to read it as as Carcosan. And so let's go back to Blair Witch. Is it a Lovecraft story? You could force it in that way if you want to. I can fit a round peg into a square hole if I get my hammer and chisel. Um, but it doesn't. It, I don't know if that was ever the intent. So there, I've said my piece. Now rip me apart, <laughs> internet meme. Yeah, and 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 for all we know, they may have gotten the idea for the sticks just from the artwork of Lee Brown Coy, which was right. the inspiration for Call It with Wagner's story. Yeah, I I froze for a second there, but you know Blair Witch. I I feel more comfortable saying it has some Lovecraftian elements. You know. Not that it's a Lovecraftian film. Okay. Yeah, I, I wouldn't put it in, like, you know, Lurker of the Lobby or something like that as a Lovecraftian film. Not mm-hmm. unless you can find, you know, point to something definitive. Well, I always go back, like Pete said a few minutes ago, is there is there cosmic horror, cosmic fear in there? If, and if, if the answer is no, I don't go with Lovecraftian either. Most of the time. I mean, that's not all Lovecraft wrote. I recognize that, but... Well, there are, you know, like, there are films which have cosmic horror elements, but are they really Lovecraftian? Like, uh, I was watching you talking to Sandy Peterson, and you were talking about uh, Quartermass in the Pit. Mm-hmm. And which is, you know, I, th- I think that's in Lurker in the Lobby as, as a Lovecraftian movie. Is it really? I mean, it's a great, it's a science fiction movie about, al- you know, it's, it's got Von Donegan type concepts of gods from outer space. But was that you know is is you know do we view Nigel Neal as sort of a Lovecraftian writer or you know maybe he was just for doing his own thing? Yeah. 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 And go ahead, Pete. I'm sorry. No, I just there are there are a few of those those British films from that time that like oh, was it X the Unknown? Yeah. And um, was it uh, Island of Terror? Yeah, I remember that one too. Which I think are borderline Lovecraftian. I think you could you could get them. You can fit that nicely into that that hole. Well, I always wondered if X the Unknown was influenced by Color Out of Space because you right. got strange radioactive. It's sort of a cross between Color Out of Space and Dunwich Horror in that the thing is originally invisible. Right. It becomes blob like and 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 it's. You know, radioactive, like in Colorado space. I agree. But I didn't realize, you know, I, it wasn't until I saw it, like a, a, again two years ago, that I said, "Oh my God, this is Lovecraftian." You know, I'd probably seen it about four or five times before that, mm-hmm. even when I was reading Lovecraft. When you saw what? Sorry. X the unknown. X the unknown. Oh, right. I, I sent you a copy of that. Yeah, you did. I liked it. You know, it's a this, nice little B movie. It's not even a, yeah. a first run, whatever British Pictures was. Um, it, it's one of those movies you 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 hated as a kid because you never saw the monster. And, <laughs> and yeah, but now as an adult, you sit back and go, "Oh man, that was brilliant." Yeah. Well, that used to be like you know when we were kids, the original Out of Limits had a smart marketing tool. tool. 
they gave you this incredibly adult science fiction plot, but they always threw in some monstrous looking alien, even if it was benign. Right. In the story. So, you know, when I was a kid, I'm going, I want to see the monster. <laughs> I don't yeah. care about all these adults talking, you know. Yeah, and whether a film is Lovecraft or not, I find it a really fun thing to talk about. What I don't get is, you know, I post something like that on the, uh, like this on the, on the Facebook page, you know, and these people get so, some people get so emotional about it. <laughs> some, not all. And I'm like, dude, calm down. Can't we just talk about it without going? God damn it, you're wrong, you know? Not on the internet, no. <laughs> I guess not. Well, I remember, uh, you know, this is totally unrelated, but I had a friend once freak out. There used to be a crummy uh, superhero show called Black Scorpion on Sci-Fi. Oh, yeah. yeah. And originally there were two TV movies that Roger Corman made and he made a, t a, a, a TV series afterwards. And the actress changed. This is the woman who dressed it up in, like, a black scorpion outfit, right? Yeah, black leather, uh, yeah. you know, sort of a poorly done Batman, female Batman. Yeah. That's the way you can describe it. Yeah. And not that we didn't, you know, I mean, it was cheesy, but, you know, we, we both, but, but I like the second actress better than the first. The, I can't remember the first actress was fairly well known, and, and and I got this horrible reaction like I was a heretic. Yeah, it's like it's like preferring Dorlitz to Lovecraft, you know. How dare you? Yeah, how dare you? Yeah. Uh, by the way, everybody watching, I'm not looking at the message board because I'm almost afraid to breathe. Otherwise, I freeze <laughs> but, uh, again. But, yeah, yeah, the same thing I posted yesterday, I think it was yesterday or the day before on the, on the website about what's the proper way to pronounce Cthulhu or however you want to say it. And, you know, the just, I linked to an article uh, from Crypto Cthulhu, 1982, where, you know, the gist of that article was even Lovecraft changed his mind on the way to pronounce it. He had differing opinions that at different times. So it's very interesting when I post it, a bunch of people don't read the article and they like, well, no, this is how you say it. You know, this is, you know, even though, even Lovecraft didn't know for sure, but they know for sure how you say Cthulhu. So, yeah. <laughs> That's how you do it. Well, I remember debating whether you should drop the C because uh, if you ever see the Haunted Palace with Vincent Price, they pronounce it Tulu in that. Right. So, sort of the mound pronunciation. And, and well, I, I'm, I, I'm reading this weird fiction uh, Kindle book. It has 101 weird fiction tales uh, for $1.99. I really I highly recommend it. It's got some good stories on there. It had Medusa's Coil in there. Uh, you guys probably remember reading that. It's been a really long time since I've read it. And, you know, that African lady, she pronounces it Clulu, if I remember right. 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 And you're probably so reading the, you're probably reading the uh, public domain version, which is a little cleaned up. No, it's not cleaned up. Let's... Well, well, if, if, if the, 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 uh, the ending was what... Uh, was very controversial. Yeah, because the, the you know it, it it gets into a very racist. I mean, it, it it's even even without that, it's a somewhat racist. But it gets in you know. I mean, I'm, I'm not giving anything away. The, the 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 original published version, or Lovecraft's original written one, had the big surprise that this woman was part black. Right. And yeah, and you, uh, you're like okay. Uh, yeah, you know, what's horrible about that? But in, in yeah. Durlitz, I mean, you can't fault him for this because he was trying to clean it up. Just as, you know, she belonged to some primordial evil, you know, ancient race of, you know, whatever. Oh, we didn't, that version ended that way instead of that she was part black? Yeah. The oh, original, I didn't know that. The original Weird Tales Arkham House version. 
Oh, I did not know that. No, this this is not the cleaned up version then. Uh, this is not the Derleth version, I guess you'd say. But the reason why I bring up that story was uh, another character's pronunciation of Cthulhu. She, if I remember right, she she pronounces it Cthulhu, right, or Cthulhu, something like that. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, Lovecraft writing. It, it's it's pronounced that way also in Wing Death. Yeah. Another revision. Right. Since you're not looking at the message board, Mike, um, Dizan Turner, God, I hope I'm saying that name right, Cthulhu is pronounced George. <laughs> well, I like somebody had a comment. I think I can't. Is I think the fellow's first name was Mark. That the name is correctly pronounced Master. I completely missed what was said. I froze. Say it again, Rick. The uh, somebody somebody posted on uh, Google that the name is correctly pronounced Master. Okay. Which I thought was a witty comment. Mm. Um, you know, it goes back. I just recently rewatched um, a Good Man Goes to War, the Doctor Who episode. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's this this one um, character who um, <clears throat> describes the Doctor as this great and, and timeless and impossible to defeat warrior. And the response is like, the Doctor's not a warrior. And she says, well, then why is he called the Doctor? And in their language, Doctor means, because that's their only counter with him, has been in war. So how you, what your, what your Importation of a word is depends on what context it's used in. So, you know, how does that? I don't know. I'm 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 reaching here. <laughs> I have All right, I, I will admit this. Mandy made the strongest sangria. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll, I'll 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 save you and get on something else. Uh, okay. Because oh. since we we're mentioning Medusa's coil, one of the. Uh, Revelations of S.T. Joshi's recently uh, annotated edition of the revisions was that has a reference to Arthur German, mm -hmm. an oh, really? African tribe. So you can you can directly connect Arthur German to uh, Lovecraft's shared mythology. Okay. And always stand alone story, but it's some. When, when that uh, African maid is going on, she mentions some some African tribe, and it's a fictional tribe that he that Lovecraft created in Arthur German. Uh, you know what? I do have a question about Medusa's coil since since we are talking about this story. Uh, and I hate to say this, I don't want to be a spoiler alert, but the story's been out for a long time now. Um, Seven years, give or take. Yeah, a few years now. The story has been out. Um, at the end, he finds out, you know, he runs out of there, the place is burning and everything, remember that? And then he goes and talks to this farmer down the road, and apparently the place burned down six years ago. Yeah, so it was sort of a ghost story, mythos story, if you right. think about it. Yeah, I mean, is that what it's supposed to be, a ghost story? Because he talks about, I can still see one of the... Oh, he froze on us, but uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> he spoke himself <laughs> again. You know, I, I was listening to Who Goes There on suspense before. You, know? <laughs> you seem to be like the creature there, duplicating yourself. Well, he froze again. Okay, he's back. <laughs> but, but you remember where he talks about a part? One of the old man's hairs is still on his arm. Yeah. 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 So I'm thinking, okay, is it a ghost story or or not? You know. I would say it was a ghost story as well. Yeah. I mean, we could come up with some, you know, intriguing time warp uh, concept to explain it, but it, I think the intent was to be a ghost story. I did think of that too. Yeah. Yeah, and there and that's a lot of uh. Arthur Mackin, who did a, no, it's not. I can't think of who. Who did all the British ghost stories? M.R. James. M.R. James. M.R. James is a, a that's a very traditional M.R. James kind of thing to do. Mm -hmm. it, it's almost as it's almost as cheap as as, but it was all a dream. 
Well, and yeah. it struck me as a bit unnecessary to the story. Right. Yeah. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't one of the best written uh, Lovecraftian stories, even if it, even if it is a revision. Yeah. It's yeah, all. Well, first of all, it's all. The lady's hair, basically. Was the moral of that story? Yeah, you know, and I, I, frankly, I just don't think women should write mythos stories. <laughs> Let's discuss that for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ziala Bishop they really didn't write that, so. right? <laughs> and and every everything indicates that you know wasn't. I mean, we have like for some people like William Lumley, we got a we got a draft. We've we've got a draft for uh, or at least an earlier published version for everything Lovecraft revised for Adolf de Castro. So we know you know. How that you know Lovecraft took stuff and and added to it, right? Which is why the last test is such a lousy story. <laughs> I read. I you know I was saying this is not as good as the other revisions. Well, he didn't rewrite the whole damn thing. That's why he just tried to make a bad story somewhat palatable. Yeah. But everything else seems to be uh, well. Uh, Clifford M. Eddy, I think, uh, he, Lovecraft had something, but most of, at least all the Hazel, he had, and the Alla Bishop stuff seems to be totally his work. Hmm. Do you hear uh, that dog in the background? Just barely. Okay. I hear, is that a dog or a clock? No, there's a... <laughs> There's a dog barking outside that... Uh, I wouldn't have noticed it unless you'd said something, that's right. Yeah. Not very loud on this end, anyway. Of course, I have a bad internet connection today, so... <laughs> yeah, they were supposed to come... It, the it, Their window yesterday was, on a Saturday, was stay home from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. You know, and we'll show up sometime in that time. Ten minutes before 8 p.m., I get a text saying... We're not going to make it? Yeah. We're not yeah. going to make it. Oh, man. <laughs> well, I love, I, love, I love those time frames because it always seems to be, if they come at all, it's near the last hour of the time frame. Yeah. yeah. Who's the company, by the way, Mike? Is it... AT&T, U-verse. Oh, oh, send them a bill. Huh. Yeah, they're going to pay for it. And... The really great thing about that text was the rest of the text read rescheduled for Monday from 9 to 5. <laughs> like, yeah, you know people work on Mondays, right? So. Um, there was a, um, I have to dig it out for you, but there was a case in Florida where this uh, lawyer sat in a doctor's office three hours past his appointment time and finally got up and left and sent the doctor a bill. <laughs> for wasting his time. And uh, they ended up in court, and guess who won? I I wouldn't venture to guess in Florida. It, it's the lawyer. Good. That's not a surprise. <laughs> you know, but apparently, you know, you can't, you can't waste people, you know, the whole, there, there's a whole idea, I have an appointment. <laughs> there, yeah. I give you some leeway, but at some point, it's not, it's not fixable. Well, they, they can bill you if you don't show up for the appointment. Exactly. So, same way around. Yeah, work the other way around, yeah. I think, the, um, I think at one point, Apple lost a court case about unreasonable wait time for customer service. Yeah, and so the gist of it is that I do have Internet, obviously, but it's, it, it, kinda, it keeps hiccuping, and it's not as fast as it's supposed to be, and it, it's kind of frustrating. So, I've been there, Mike. I know. Yeah. yeah, you know, I thought it would be fixed by today in time for the for the show, and it's not. So, but you know, could be worse. So, but that's why I'm freezing today, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, just look at it this way: the conversation, the quality of the conversation goes up every time I'm kicked out of the show. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so Olivia and and you guys too. Uh, I sent you that that article. Somebody wrote a. This is how you write Lovecraftian fiction article. And 
Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I, I, I sent it to you guys, and Olivia had a real nice response to that. So I'll let her take over. Well, it wasn't an article, in my opinion. It, it, I took a quick look at the website, and it just looked like a whole bunch of tiny little, uh, you know, paid, you know, you know, paid for content type articles. You know, the kind where they say write about this, and they give you, you know, the writer one or two words. And and in this case, there was a whole bunch of articles. You know, how do, how do you write Lovecraftian? How do you like write weird fiction? And the article itself, the article, <laughs> um, a lot of it I just kind of skimmed over because I didn't really feel that there was any kind of point to what he or she was saying. Uh, there was a there was like one one takeaway was. Um, in order to write Lovecraftian fiction, you need to be familiar with Lovecraft's works. And Wait, his... let, me, let me write that down. I want to. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's really it's a it's an, a very original concept, and I'm glad the article you know was able to to you know present that to the world, <laughs> and that will change the way Lovecraftian fiction is written going forward. I'm sure. But then I I forget that there was the other sentence that I. I, I highlighted and put in the email. Um, what was it? Basically, it it just showed that the the writer didn't seem to know if if anyone was writing this kind of fiction, and if if by being familiar with Lovecraft's work, could that translate to to well written fiction in 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 today's contemporary times? Can it can there be contemporary authors writing Lovecraftian fiction? Could there be? Is there such a thing? And so that's I. Yeah. If that had come at the first part of the article, I wouldn't have writ, read the rest. But it came at the last in the last couple of sentences, and so I thought, you know, the it just it it negated it negated the entire article for me. It's not it's not an article about you know writing Lovecraftian fiction. I know it's shocking. It's it's just so, an article someone wrote probably for. You know, I don't know how many half pennies a word, but <laughs> I want to read you two two lines out of this thing. <laughs> His universe is populated by numerous big entities referred to as the Elder Gods and the pre nice previous ones. Big. Subsequent to that, <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm gonna write the nice previous ones. <laughs> yeah, you know, and you notice I sent you guys the link with a very. This is not what I. I with just completely neutral. I didn't say <laughs> read this piece of shit. I just said, what do you think of this article? <laughs> but you know, as a as an editor of a Lovecraftian slash weird fiction and cosmic horror magazine, I see articles like this on the web. And I'm like, okay, I gotta check that out. And I was like. Holy Christ. And now here, here's one where comma placement is really, really important. <laughs> His elder gods weren't true gods, comma. However, aliens sufficiently influential, comma, highly effective and educated to be worshipped as such by humankind. Without, the, without another comma, after however, this is a fragment. It, it doesn't make any sense. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so... His other gods weren't true gods, however, comma, <laughs> or rather, aliens... Oh. Who, who, who would we consider the nice previous ones? The I, gods of the dreamlands or something? Oh, those would be the great ones, right? Yeah. You no, know, the awesome gods. Awesome. <laughs> I am, my gods are awesome gods. Yeah, and you have to do this awesome. <laughs> Yeah, so, which, of course, begs the question of how do you write good Lovecraftian fiction? Uh, I'm not going to say much on this. I'll let you guys... But I will say this. that It strikes me that when you're asked that question or when you consider that question, you kind of... You, you either go with writing a good pastiche, which, for example, I don't think pastiche is a bad word. This is a very, very good book, yeah, but it's uh, pastiche. I know? agree with that assessment. Um... And 
or you know uh, uh, something that's not pastiche, something that's cosmic horror, cosmic fear. You know the the themes that Lovecraft used a lot. You know, so. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm reading the comments. <laughs> Mock not the previous ones. <laughs> I have to check them out later. <laughs> the previous ones will get you, yeah. <laughs> Maybe the previous ones were the ones in the quarter mass experiment. <laughs> we don't know their names. <laughs> they were the previous ones. Yeah. <laughs> You have appointment? Yes, we're the previous ones. <laughs> I'm the previous one. I don't need an appointment. Oh, so how do you write Lovecraftian fiction? Um, I don't know. Well, I'll tell you what. If you want to write pastiche, read this book to find out how it's done right. I'll tell you that. Or reanimators. More examples. Sorry, Rick. Go ahead. Reanimators. Is mm -hmm. it, it, it is I don't I don't think it take this the wrong way, Pete. It's it's pastiche. Uh, look, you know I have no. Don't get me wrong, I love Livia's work, I love Mike Griffin's work, I love Stuart uh, Simon Strands's work, and Scott Nicolay, Thomas Ligotti, um, Laird Barron, Laird Barron, John Langan. These these are guys who are are pushing the boundary of. Horror and yeah, I'm sucking up, Livia. Um, <laughs> what we think about horror, lit, horror into literature, They're absolutely. And yeah, there's a few times where I've strayed into trying to do that with language and themes and whatnot. But what I really want to write is good old-fashioned pulp fiction. And, yeah. and you should always write what you're moved to write, not. Right. For any other reason, I mean, and, maybe it's the shade thing to say, but it's true. Right. And you know what I feel that was lack. Okay, so let's face it. Lynn Carter died. Lynn Carter was not the greatest writer, but I grew up reading his stuff, and he was very entertaining. And I felt that 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 was missing. So when I sit down to write stuff, yes, I'm highly influenced by Lovecraft, Lynn Carter, Brian Lumley, August Derleth. Yes. And you can see that as I, my novels are put together novels, because well, I was raised in, in the seventies on fantasy and science fiction, where you read a very truncated novelette in magazine form, and then six months later it was out as a book. That was the way things were done, and that's how I learned to write and read, and that's what I wanted to do. And by the way, there is a Brian Lumley reference in here. There you go. A very, you know, I was, I, you know, for a moment I didn't get it, and I'm going, oh, that's to what happened in the Titus Crow novel. So, yeah, I mean, this is what I want to write. I want to write, I yes, pe fine, pastiche, I'm, I'm all for it. That's that's what I want to be called, fine. I don't care. You well, know, I want to say it's like, there's, you know, I write pulp fiction, too, and, and more hero pulp stuff than mythos. And I would say, you know, there's a school for the traditional Lovecraft. I think what you and, what I'll say, the good pastiche writers, to some degree Bob Bob Price is in that category. I think he's closer to pastiche, even though he was his religious background. He sometimes veers into some very original uh, areas. Is you're not getting, you see, Durlitz and Carter were too repetitious. Mm -hmm. Repetitious not only in plot but in in uh, presentation. You know, you can you read Durlitz after a while. You're going to memorize two quotes from the Necronomicon. Right, the right. One about the yeah. banishment and of the great ones and about the elder side. In plot, sorry. Uh, if you are going to be repetitious in plot, you can't be repetitious in the presentation in the presentation. You know, of it. If, right. if, yeah. if that's just the plot that you just got to write about, you know. Anyway, go ahead, Rick. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, because what, what I think Durlitz, one of his problems was he was trying to market the mythos, and he was feeling people didn't understand it, so he was saying, he, it, was, it was his interpretation of it, first of all, elder gods versus great old ones. 
-hmm. when you get a long dissertation of that, a mention of probably every mythos deity imaginable, at least the one is created by Lovecraft. And, you know, as I said before, the, the, the two quotes from the Necronomicon, one's on the Elder's side, one's about the banishment of the Great Old Ones. Every sorcerer in the world seemed to have those two quotes in a notebook somewhere. Right. Right. And Pete mentioned several times the uh, Durleth protagonist that inherits the house. And, you know. Right. The, 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 the one thing I've, and Livy, you probably haven't heard this, but the one thing I've learned from reading Derelith is that Arkham, Massachusetts has the worst fire department <laughs> in the of, of the world, right? Because everything burns down in Arkham. <laughs> everything. And not just a little, it always burns to the ground. It's like the guys show up and they're pumping gasoline onto it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it was somewhat, you know, since you mentioned it, I was mentioning the Brian Lumley reference in, in The Revenant of Rebecca Pascal. It's to the 1980 fire in the transition of Titus Crow where all of Arkham pretty much burns down. Right, and then you get um, oh, uh, New Miskatonic in Vermont. Yeah. Yeah, no. You, you know, uh, on on this question of how do you write good Lovecraftian fiction... Oh, we, the, we completely reared from that. Right? Yeah, well, it's, it's one of the... <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> as, I think it's, you know, Revenant of Rebecca Pascal, you know, it's, it's a plot that you've seen before, but it's done extremely mm -hmm. well. You know, and there's nothing wrong with doing a... Uh, writing a plot that's been done before somewhat, but how well are you doing it, you know? Right. Well, when, I, when I remember when I was reading uh, Lovecraftian fiction in the 80s, I kind of this, we had Ramsey Campbell and Brian Lumley, and, 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 and Ramsey's going into the unusual areas. He's writing, you know, the Vladimir Nabokov version of Lovecraft. <laughs> Because, you know, I mean, even the Franklin Paragraphs is a reference to a character from Vladimir. Right, right, right. I mean, he's, he's, he's trying to, to mesh Lovecraft with different forms of literature. And Brian Lumley is writing pretty original, as opposed to Lynn Carter's stuff, traditional pulp. Right, with, you know, with Ian Fleming. Right, but he's got <laughs> you know, a little of Doctor Who in there, too, yep. and, and, and whatever, but... But I, you know, I, I, I would enjoy Lumley a lot more than I enjoyed Durlitz and Carter. Right. So how do we write a good... You read a lot? Uh, that's number one, yeah. yeah. You read a lot. You know, and, and you even have to read the stuff you don't like because you, I really... I need to know what other people are doing or trying to do and where they're succeeding and where they're failing. And you have to read more than one um, genre. You can't just read horror. You can't just read Lovecraft right. or weird fiction. You know, you need to read science fiction, detective stories. Uh, you know, in my opinion, uh, I. No, you're right. Um, and some of some of my favorite Lovecraftian novels have, are are tangential Lovecraftian novels. Um, Cavalier and Clay. By Michael Chabon. Yeah. Is a pretty much, you can make the argument that it's set in Lovecraft's universe. Nothing Lovecraftian ever happens in that book. But the characters arrive in the United States on the USS Miskatonic, yeah. implying that it's part of, the, it's part of that universe. Um, yeah, you know, a, that doesn't really well. I don't think I've read that one. Yeah. There's a Civil War novel, which also has a has a which has a um, a uh, a Union uh, battleship named the Miskatonic as well. Hmm. So I throw that into my collection. Um, and the guy who wrote it is a he has written some um, Lovecraftian fiction as well. I can't think of his name right now, but the story I like by him. Which is it was which is humor, which I don't particularly enjoy that much, but I like this story. Was the running back from Yugga? Um, yeah, I've read that. I, I there was in fantasy book or something. Yes. Time yeah. I can't remember who wrote it, but I remember enjoying it. 
Yeah. So, but yeah, you you have to read a lot, and then you have to hone your writing skills. Read read Livia; she does it better. <laughs> uh, but but I think your your point, Pete, was that, and I did this before I started to bring in Lovecraft stuff uh, directly. Is you want to kind of make you know if 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 all if Arkham and everything else existed. There would be stories that they exist, in which we don't. Where well, there's no supernatural or cosmic horror or, right. or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I'd love to see romances, just pure romances, set in Arkham. Um, and they always end happily ever after, because, yeah. or at least in Innsmouth, they do, because they <laughs> live happily ever after under the sea. Right. Actually. I have a story <laughs> half written. Um, you've heard of the phrase "boss" a Boston marriage, correct? Yeah. A bo yeah, a Boston marriage. Two women living together uh, who are friends, um, but are who are actually lovers. But it's called a Boston marriage. Well, a couple of years ago, I came up with the phrase "miskatonic marriage," <laughs> where. A human and a non-human live together, supposedly just, you know, as roommates, but are actually romantically involved. <laughs> um, I haven't worked all out all of the biological particulars, but um, it it is a, like kind of a gothic romance. It's a love story. There's a happy ending. <laughs> but I'm not used to writing stories with happy endings, which is why I haven't finished it yet. Because you know, I'm used to you know. Cosmic destruction and you know right, right. <laughs> the death of the soul and you know. Well, you know that's a, it's sort of an original concept. You know, I'm sure there's uh, you know there's some human that Yak Sothas made it with. We cared for at some point in his life. <laughs> uh, Margaret Carter has written several. Is that her name, Margaret Carter? I think so. Has written several um, Lovecraftian romances. Um, like one of them is the Wind Walker's Mate, um, and there's a few other. Oh, did we lose Mike again? Yeah, oh, we did. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 he's there. He's so he's just, fun with his internet connection. Let me tell you, I am gonna let that guy have it if he even shows up tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you never appreciate a good internet connection until you lose it. Right. Well, what did I miss? Oh, well, we just, you know, life, the universe, everything. You solved the question of how to be a great writer and editor, and, and I missed Absolutely. it. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Livy was telling us she's writing this incredible romance story about uh, a human and a great old one or something cosmic. Well, some, something Lovecraftian in nature, not not mm. divine in nature, you know. Mm. But well, actually, you're... my short story, Take Your Daughters to Work, um, it's Lovecraftian. Yeah, I was going to say... There's some well, romance in it. Um, yeah, I was going to say to the audience, the, what's the name of your collection, Livia, again? Uh, Engines of Desire. Engines of Desire. Uh, everybody watching, you really should pick that up. Um, it's re really good, so... But anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no. Take your daughters to work, and there's there's a moment when the the young female protagonist Sadie, you know, sees a, a young man with gills, and he's like one of the the newer creatures who you know uh, an immigrant to their great city, and um, you know she's she's being well, I won't say what she, what's happening to her, but but she meets <laughs> the young man again at the end of the story. She sees him in 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 a crowd, so to speak, and realizes that, you know, her life, her life as it is now is ending, but, you know, there are opportunities for love, you know, where she's going, and, you know, because she's not, she's not quite human herself, and so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Romance right. is possible in a Lovecraftian universe. <laughs> you, you know, at some point, somebody's going to put out a collection of mythos love stories. You, well, there's are there are mythos erotica collections. Uh, oh, no, 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 but, but if if you look at Lovecraft monsters, there were uh, two stories in there that I would consider uh, ro romance stories. I think the unspeakable betrothal is one of the most beautiful love stories I've ever read. 
<laughs> Which one is it? Robert Block's Unspeakable Betrothal. Oh, okay. Which he, he didn't want to title that. He I know. A, I, I know. I don't know what the original title was, but it was an Unspeakable Betrothal. <laughs> But yes, Caitlin Kiernan's story in Lovecraft's Monsters is very much a romance. It's a love story. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Kimberly would like us to do My Big Fat Rely Wedding. <laughs> <laughs> and Eisen would again like Jeff, the postmaster of Arkham. <laughs> you know, I think that would, you know, could you imagine being the postmaster in Arkham? Actually, there's a, there's a story in Lovecraft Easing from about a year ago about this guy moves to, I don't remember if it's Arkham or Innsmouth, because he works for the post office and they've got an opening as postmaster. And did I freeze again? Or you guys just... No, you're good. We're just waiting for you to hit the punchline. Well, <laughs> it basically is, is like the guy moves to whatever it was, either Arkham or Innsmouth, and it's kind of like... This is what happens to the guy next, you know, and it's pretty interesting. But I just thought of that since you talked about Postmaster. Well, yeah. well I, I think we need a novel that's when Dagon met Hydra. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a beautiful love story hidden in there. Oh, yeah. It's kind um, of been Harry yeah. met Sally, but with tentacles slapping the table. <laughs> 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 you know, well, 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 you get into yes. a debate of yes. <laughs> what exactly does Hydra look like? We have an idea of what Dagon looks like. <laughs> it was, is, is, is Lovecraft's Hydra, is Henry Cutler's Hydra, and you get into all sorts of arguments. Well, like Daniel Harms makes it clear that you should not confuse the two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well you can you debate, are... you know, I, I think Daniel Harms does a great service in that book, and I consult it a lot. But you know, it as with everybody, yeah, yeah, there are. You, you, you can challenge anybody's. You know, there, as Ramsey Campbell once said, there are so many people with different views of the mythos now. You'll never reconcile them all. Absolutely, and that's the way it should be. You know. Um, no, no, no. There, <laughs> no, and then, the, except, except with reanimated stories, because uh, right, right, once I'm, I'm, history I, and. Uh, I forgot you liked for everything to mesh up perfectly. Everything well, has to mesh. Yeah, it all has so to work together. Forgive me. I do that was in, you know, I, I get in, in the debates because yeah. I'm involved. <laughs> As you know, Pete, I'm involved with the Philip Jose Farmer Group. Right. And I just, you know, will say things like, uh, you know, I like this, but uh, I really don't want to see the other Logophilius Fog. I kind of like the Jules Verne version of Phileas Fogg. I don't want to make Phileas Fogg a space alien. Right. Right. Um, yeah, and there are, yeah, I have tried, I have tried and tried and tried to, to mesh up Daryl's history of the Lovecraft stuff to, to Lovecraft stuff, and it just doesn't work. You can't do it. Yeah. And, you know, you just have to accept it. Yeah, in, in Darlish Universe, Lovecraft was a was a writer, and he wrote fiction, and that's that was the way. Supposedly true. Right. That was supposedly true, and that if you have a copy of The Outsider and others from Arkham House, you get plus three to your mythos knowledge. Well, well you can reconcile all this. It's basically like the DC universes, where you know there's one version of Superman, and then the other, another, an Earth Two version of Superman. The same thing with Lovecraft. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> exactly. Well, that concept has entered Philip Jose Farmer style fiction. I've I've used it. I've I've, I've di I did my equivalent of Earth One, Earth Two. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> All right. So. Yeah. Well. So, Olivia, besides writing a uh, Lovecraftian romance, what are you working yeah. on? What are you reading? What I'm oh talk to us, woman. What I'm reading now? Uh, <laughs> um, well, let's see. Um, I actually let me look at my. I just started reading 
of all things, white oleander. Um, I okay. I know. I understand. I understand. I work for a very large publishing company, and everyone gets tons and tons of books from other publishing companies. And then they, we have these massive take shelves, and everyone puts the books they don't want anymore on the take shelves. And people like me come along and take the books. And I saw this book, and I thought, oh, that's the movie that Michelle Pfeiffer was in. That's like women's fiction. And then I picked it up, and I started reading the first page just to confirm that it was bad, like I thought it was. And that woman can write the fuck out of a sentence. I was shocked. It's beautiful, beautiful language. It's not anything I would ever have picked up in a million years. You understand? <laughs> no, I do. I, I feel the exact same way about Kevin Spacey. <laughs> there is nothing about Kevin Spacey that makes me want to go see his movies. And yet, every time I see a Kevin Spacey film, it's brilliant. Yeah. That is true. That is true. I don't know. Robin Hood uh, wasn't exactly brilliant. No, not Kevin Costner. Kevin, no, Kevin Costner. Oh, Kevin, oh, excuse me, Kevin Spacey. I'm Kevin sorry. Kevin Spacey. Oh, yeah. Kevin Spacey is brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin Costner, totally different reaction. He's brilliant in a whole different way, let's just say. Well, you know, as long as you're, you, you cast him as an emotional wreck who can't express his feelings, he's perfect. <laughs> Dances with Wolves, The New Dog. Getting back to yeah, New Daughter. Now there's a Lovecraftian movie. There's a Lovecraftian film. I think that, and that's that's written by one of your favorite writers, Mike. Mm -hmm. John Connolly. Who, once again, I I think of as a, a mystery writer, but has one been publishing a lot of of horror, and two has been publishing a lot of kids books. Yeah, yeah, he has, hasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, he's got this this series, the Charlie Parker series, and right. when it starts off, it's basically a detective series, and then slowly this supernatural element creeps into the series. Yeah. Which. And we've lost Mike again. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know. Welcome you back, Mike. Got him back. I was saying. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. this... That's. Go ahead. I was saying. That's sometimes good about a series when, it, you know, well, you, you can either have one of two reactions. You didn't want you didn't want to read this type of fiction. You were reading it for the crime fiction, or you know, you're gradually shocked in the direction this is taking, and you kind of like it. Yeah, yeah. and um, the Dexter books went that way too. Dexter books. Yeah, you know the dark. You, you know, uh, the television yeah. series Dexter is actually based on a series of books. Oh, I haven't even seen the series. But, they went uh, supernatural. Yeah. Yeah. His, his dark other was an actual thing. Oh wow. Oh wow. So. Well, it's sometimes you get series which are or or schizophrenic in that they go back between uh, more non non supernatural and supernatural. Dennis Wheatley being the. Uh, you know, you talk about you know merging Ian Fleming was the mythos. Wheatley, who influenced Fleming, was merging the spy novel and the uh, supernatural novel be long before we had uh, Charlie Strauss and right. Brian Bloom and everybody else. Yep. Yep. And by the way, Dizan says that um, the, his quote of the day is that woman can write the fuck out of a sentence. <laughs> Yeah, and actually, I'm going to put that up on my Facebook tonight, Olivia. You know, that is going to be... Oh, good. <laughs> you know, that, that made my day. Darling, could I have a glass of sangria? <laughs> and apparently I'm not as entertaining as, as when I'm drunk. Thank you. Can I plug another uh, Lovecraftian book? Yeah. Even though it... We've we've talked about this before, but the the Children of Old Leech at least is available as an ebook if you uh, pre-ordered it, and I got that and it's excellent. Yeah, Stories that's a, I don't know, it's a tribute anthology to uh, Laird Barron's fiction. Yeah, Justin did it. Justin Steele did a great job with uh, 
Ross Lockhart on that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Great story by Joe, great story by John Langan, Richard Gavin, Mike Griffin. I'm going to get Jeff Thomas. I'm going to forget somebody. But Mike Griffin. Of, oh, Co Cody Goodfellow had a good one. Yeah. He didn't use the... Um, he didn't go with the supernatural. He went with the... Um, I think Light in the Darkness was the uh, short oh, novel. The Light is the Darkness, yeah. The Light is the dark. He went into the, the whole uh, illegal gladiatorial fighting angle. Hmm. Yeah, it's a good book. Mm -hmm. It really is. Well, before I freeze again, I'm going to go eat dinner. And... Uh, <laughs> Livia, um, Mike, before you 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 yeah. shut, a lot of people don't know who Livia is. So could you? Everyone knows who Rick and I are, but Livia, introduce I'm yourself. I'm sure about that. Well, I'm looking at the posting. And, and everyone's post. going, "Who the fuck is that chick?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you must have had bad laugh. reading two weeks ago. Who is this enchanting smile, laughing woman? Please, does she write? <laughs> <laughs> Engines of Desire. Buy that book. Yeah, you, you really should. Why don't I introduce, give myself a sh short introduction? Um, there you go. Um, That's what I'm <laughs> oh my God. Oh, I'm jealous. <laughs> when you can't see through the sangria, you know that it's good. Wow. That's like blood. <laughs> I'm totally distracted by your drink. Anyway, um, I'm a writer of uh, dark fantasy, horror, and erotica. A l most of it which has Lovecraftian themes. And I've been writing for about eight years now. <laughs> what, are you already drunk? <laughs> you know, no, but all you things have a Lovecraftian theme. <laughs> I, I think he was drunk before the broadcast. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty usual, though, isn't it? <laughs> So anyway, <laughs> I have um, one collection out through Lethe Press, Engines of Desire, Tales of Love, and Other Horrors. It was nominated for a Shirley Jackson Award for Best Collection, and uh, a novelette in it, Omphalos, was nominated for Best Novelette. And um, I have almost enough of fiction published since then to for another collection, and... Um, I have a short story called Furnace, which was published in Joe Pulver's edited The Grimscribe's Puppets, and that's been nominated for a Shirley Jackson Award. Yeah, um, I really did like that one, too. That's a very good short story. Thank you. And I'm currently working on a novel, a couple of, of short stories, but I'm mainly trying to finish a novel this year, So, which it will be basically... I would call it literary erotica, literary erotic horror. So, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so, I was at Starbucks today with another writer, and we were talking about our books and publishing issues, and our barista comes over, he says, you know, I'm writing a novel. <laughs> I'm like, oh, good. And who the fuck is it? <laughs> it's like, yeah, apparently my barista is writing a novel. I was like, what am I, in L.A.? You know, do you have a screenplay you want to show me? Well, I live in Jersey City, and there's actually, I guess, a lot more writers in this area. I guess all the writers who couldn't afford to live in Brooklyn live in Jersey City. So everyone I run into here is writing a novel. I work in Manhattan for a publisher. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, they everyone I know. They have manuscripts in your hallway. They well, should move to Detroit because there's free housing for writers in Detroit. That's right. Yeah, I bet there is. <laughs> <laughs> I got, you got that email? I got that email. Yeah, Come to Detroit, 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 we'll give you a house. <laughs> I don't want to Detroit, though. Give me a, will you give me a Glock, too? <laughs> I was going to say, uh, <laughs> I'd like some protective armor, maybe? <laughs> oh, my God. Has anyone left? <laughs> so we're all here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Everyone's cutting out. <laughs> well, anyway... Uh, <laughs> Guys, thanks for being here, and hopefully next Sunday my connection will be much better. Uh, audience, everybody watching, pick up Engines of Desire by Olivia Llewellyn. Pick up Reanimators by Pete Rollick. 
And if you want to see what Rick's written, just go to Rick's website, which forwards over to his Shadows Amazon. Shadows of the Opera. Hmm? Shadows of yeah. the Opera. Yeah, right. And two, three sequels now, my, uh, Rick? Whatever uh, your name is. Well, there's a direct sequel and there's sort of one in the same universe. All right. You can also go to ricklay.com. So. And my website has a lot of free fiction links. So. I don't have a complete technocrat, and I don't have a website. <laughs> you just have sangria. <laughs> well, I, th I think Mike Mike in invented one for you. Actually, Mike you did invent one. my website for me. But, yeah, all <laughs> you you need, invented mine. Yeah. yeah. All you need is kill, and all you need is sangria. <laughs> All right, well, thanks, guys. Thanks for putting up with my connection. Oh, so, thank you. Talk to you guys soon. Okay. Bye, guys. Get that internet shit fixed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're still live, Mike. Yeah. I know. Talk to you later.